So, uh, hey everybody, what's up? Yeah, glad you're here. So, um, welcome to week three of our series, In Your Eye. This, is, uh, this has been kind of slow grow, this whole series, uh, but I'm kind of happy with where it's gone and, and uh, kind of how everybody's engaging and thinking about it. And uh, I've heard a couple of parents, I had two parents actually, separate parents, come up to me and say, what are you teaching those guys on Wednesday night? And I said, um, <laughs> you know, it was one of those nervous moments where I thought maybe they learned how to light their farts on fire or something, but, uh, but they were like, no, no, they're like trying to be careful about how many video games they play. Uh, that was one of them. And the other one was talking about how they were like, you know, examining their boyfriend, girlfriend relationships and stuff like that. So those are always good things to figure out why we do what we do. Uh, and so the first uh, week we talked about um, the, the whole idea for this whole series, which is basically that uh, every place in the Bible and actually everywhere through human history, uh, every time we get in a lot of trouble, um, it's because we forget about God and we do what we think is right in our own eyes. And that always leads us to destruction, it always leads us to hard things, and it just gets worse and worse, and it kind of accumulates over time. Um, and so then week two, we talked about the God of romance, and how a lot of times students um, will sort of begin the whole dating thing, or I like guys, I like girls kind of thing, uh, and that's not a bad thing. All the things that we've talked about so far are not bad things. But what happens is sometimes we get them out of place and we put things uh, where they shouldn't be. So dating isn't bad, and this night might not even be an issue for you yet. You may be in sixth grade, seventh grade, and you're just like, I don't even, I don't, you might be in 12th grade, and you're like, I don't even, yeah. So, uh, so this might not, but it might be, and I would be a really crappy youth pastor if I didn't like point out where there was something hot and steamy that you might step in. So that's kind of the point of me doing that is uh so we talked about that whole dating thing last week jeff did a great job didn't jeff do a great job last week talking to us about <clears throat> about the god of entertainment and how if we're not careful we can spend all our time going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing and we've always got to be busy we've always got to have uh something entertaining our lives uh, and this week we're going to be looking at the God of achievement, the God of achievement. So before we jump in again, I just want to emphasize this point. None of these things that we're talking about or have talked about are bad things in and of themselves. Romance, dating, by the way, can be a very good thing. It can be a very good thing. I've had students in my youth ministry who um, have dated and have tried to really do it God's way. And uh, now they're married and they have children, which I don't know if you're thinking that's a good thing or not. But... Uh, that's, I mean, they've done it really well. And I've had students in my youth ministry that, uh, that dated, and they broke up, and it wasn't like, oh, my life is over. Why? Because they kept it in the proper place. They didn't make it too important. They didn't make a temporary dating relationship something that they kind of hung their hat on. And same thing with the entertainment thing. These things are not bad. God wants us to have fun. He invented the thing, Right? But what happens is we get them out of place. So where we get into trouble is when we get to, like what we're talking about this week, we start to worship things instead of the God of things. We start worshiping the created rather than the creator, and we find our identity in those things, and we start worshiping our accomplishments. I got a video that's going to kind of talk a little bit about one particular girl's struggle with this. So let's see if we can get the video to fly. Trying to fit in is really one of the hardest things that, that really bothers me because, you know, I've always been in sports, played softball freshman and sophomore year, and that growing and that bonding with, like, my friends and everything, it was just really great, and I had that acceptance. I had that love, and the competition was so, was so hard. Um, I just felt that people judged me on if I did good or not, and so I was always walking on eggshells trying to impress everybody. My head was in this tiny little ball, and it was just softball, 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 and that's it. My dad definitely pushed me really hard to um, always be number one. Never, um, never number two. If I was late to something, he would make me run at home. Um, like if I had messed up in a game, I would just 
hate to go to him to see what he'd have to say. My relationship with Christ got very weak in softball. Um, I tried to be that leader to show people like who he is, and I just, I failed at it. I didn't really pray, I didn't read my word, and I didn't stand up for who I believed in. When I tore my knee this past year, it really took a toll on me. Um, I didn't understand why it had to happen. I didn't understand um, the things that were going on in my knee. And um, it just, it really hurt me because I felt accepted in softball. I felt, you know, that, that love. And um, I don't have as many friends as I did when I played softball um, because they, they just noticed me for the athletic abilities. They didn't really notice me for me. It does hurt at times. I do think about, wow, you know, what if I did stay with softball? What if I hadn't torn my knee? What if I hadn't done all this? What if, what if? And it took a major toll on me. And just at summer camp this past year, I, I was just, I gave it all to God. And when I got back, um, my doctor said, you can't play softball again. And I said, okay. And um, when my friend says, you don't need softball, look up. He's looking down at you and wants your love. Yeah, and you know what? Softball might not be your thing, but the question is, who are you? Who are you? How much of your identity is wrapped up in what you do rather than who you are? Um, when I was uh, in, like, late elementary uh, or in elementary school or whatever, uh, one of the things my dad drilled into my head over and over and over again was... A hard day's work for an honest day's pay. A hard day's work for an honest day's pay. And over and over again, my family was based on, based everything in my family on this idea that if you work hard enough, you can do anything you want. You can be the best. And so in my family was a really strong work ethic. So when I was, uh, when I was like in fourth grade, I went out for my first tackle football team and I felt like it was my job to hit everyone harder than everyone else. I just thought that was my job. And I did that. I remember uh, it was a boy, um, um, boys club team, and I went out for football, and uh, the, I was like late to sign up, so I got these really crappy pads and this really crappy helmet. And so I went to the first practice. I knocked some kid's brain out, and the coach took me back to the boys club and said, well, get this boy some new pads, because He's going to hurt somebody. Anyway, probably himself. So I did that. And when I was in baseball, I did that. The problem was I wasn't a great athlete. I just had a really hard work ethic. So I did that. And for a little while, uh, I was good. But here's the deal. Good wasn't good enough for me. It wasn't good enough for me. I had to be better than good. So uh, then when I got more toward uh, middle school, uh, I discovered I had a talent for music and for singing uh, and things like that. So uh, I was in the choir, and that wasn't good enough for me. I was the first chair uh, in choir, and that wasn't good enough for me. I had to uh, eventually got selected to sing solos uh, at different performances, and I would I started measuring myself by how many solos I had, uh, and whether I had more than that kid or that kid. And uh, so that wasn't enough for me. I got to high school. Uh, doing the music thing kind of led to being in plays and musicals and things like that. When I got in high school, I started measuring myself by how many times I could get the lead in a play or in a musical. And by the time I was a senior, I was a president of uh, the theater club. I was president of the, of the choir. I was the guy, right? And I was performing and doing all this stuff and I was working really hard. And I remember the time for the audition for the most important play of the year came up, which was a one act competition play. Like it was, you competed against other high school. In Texas, theater's like a full contact sport. So anyway, uh, that's where I went to high school was in Texas. And so uh, I worked my tail off. I auditioned for this part. It was the lead in, the, in this play. I was a senior. This was my part, right? So I, uh, I worked really hard. I did research on the character so I could know who he was. I came to the audition with parts of the script already memorized, uh, and I put everything I had into that audition. And uh, the day that they posted the cast and I found out that I had a supporting role and not the lead role, I do what all teenagers uh, tend to do or what 
actually all humans tend to do. And I blamed everybody else, and I went on a rant, and I just was like, this is not fair, and I quit, and all this other crap. That's, you know, and now looking back, it just seems so silly, doesn't it? It just seems so silly, but at the time, it was so important to me. Why? Because I had put all my chips in the basket of achievement and in the basket of performance. And suddenly, without getting that lead, I didn't know who I was. I wasn't who I was supposed to be anymore because I was supposed to be the guy. Now who was I? Right? And it was my brother who finally, first of all, told me to get over myself, which is good. Maybe somebody needs to tell you that from time to time, too. But he also said these amazing words to me, and I've never forgotten them. Uh, Dan, you're more than the part you play. You're more than the part you play. And then he talked about, you know what, Dan, you're this and you're that. And uh, he was just very encouraging to me. And um, and he made me understand that putting all your baskets and your and all your chips in the basket of accomplishments is a big mistake. So can I just tell you right now, in case no one has said this to you, that you're more than what you do. You're more than your accomplishments. You're more than your grades. Your grades don't measure you. You're more than the sport that you play, and you're more than a spot in the band. You're more than that. And you and I can easily slip into kind of believing that God is a lot like us and that he measures us by what we do. Because we do that, don't we? Don't we measure people by what they do? I mean, you just talk about somebody and you're like, oh, yeah, that's Jennifer. She, what? The next thing out of your mouth is something that she does, right? She's a cheerleader. She's a great student. Whatever. We measure people by these things. And so it, it's kind of this, we, we get into thinking that, that God is a formula God. God is a formula God. If I do A, then he's supposed to do B. If I perform well, if I act right, if I do things good, then God will love me. And it's the same thing with humans sometimes. We think that it's about A equals B. We think that God is a formula God. So what does God have to say about this? Is there any place in the Bible where God talks about this? Well, actually, God talks about this a lot, by the way. Uh, and, and, but what we're, we're going to do is just look at one particular story. It's in Luke chapter 10. And you may have heard this story a hundred times, but I want you to really listen with some fresh ears tonight, okay? So listen to this. This is uh, Luke chapter 10. At the very end of the chapter... Uh, Jesus, uh, we hear a story about Jesus. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, this was somebody that Jesus already had a relationship with. Um, Mary and Martha, this is two women that he already knew. And so whenever they were in town, they stayed at Martha's house. It was just kind of the deal, right? So then verse 39, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. So she's running around. You got Jesus. You got disciples. There's a lot of people to be fed, right? And Martha's running around doing her thing. And Mary just sitting there. Okay, you can kind of see where this is going. It doesn't take a rocket scientist. So it says, uh, she came to him and asked, this is Martha, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Right? How many times have you said something like that to you? God, you need to tell her she's going to get right. All right. So then verse 41, it says, Martha, Martha. And I've never been able to decide if he's, if he's like, Martha, Martha. Or if he's like, Martha, Martha. Like, I'm trying to get your, would you just stop? Would, if you would, oh, geez. Of course, he would never say that because he is, oh, geez. Anyway. So, Martha, Martha, all right, the Lord answered, and then it says, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. This is where Jesus gets creepy. Like, he says things where people are like, what? Like, they just kind of go, what did he just say? What does that even mean, right? So, he says, uh, he says, you're worried about all these different things, but really, only a few things are needed, and actually, really just one thing, right? 
And then Mary, and then he says, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Okay, so in this story, this is a story where you see two people doing contrasting things, right? And what we can do from this story is learn a couple of things that will help us kind of dethrone the God of achievement, all right? So there's two words that show the difference that are really the difference between Mary and Martha, and they're both action words, right? So the, the two words are this, distracted and chosen. Say that, distracted and chosen. Say that, distracted and chosen. Two really, really important words, really important words, and you're going to see why in just a second. Martha was distracted. Mary chose. Martha was so busy doing things that she missed the reason for those things. A lot of times I get to do weddings and uh, perform weddings for couples. I've done a bunch over the years, and um, one of the things that that never fails to happen is, uh, you know, like two weeks before the wedding, the week before the wedding, it just gets wild, right? It gets crazy, and the bride's running around and all this stuff, and there's drama with the mama. You know what I'm talking about? It might have been around a wedding, and it's like, what the, is this a full contact sport? And so, like, there's all that kind of crap going on or whatever, and one of the things that I've learned as a pastor is to call the bride either the night or two nights before, somewhere right around in there, like I did with Kylie Ray who's backstage there. Uh, <laughs> what? Say something. <laughs> like I did with Kylie Ray, and just say, are you okay? Everything okay? Like, and, and one of the things I always say to the bride is, don't miss the wedding because of the wedding. You know what I mean? Like you can get so caught up in the doing that you forget the reason for the thing. And the things, now here's the the deal though. The things that Martha was doing were important. They were important things. They needed to be done. Dishes don't wash themselves. Some of y'all need to know that. I've talked to your parents. All right, so dishes don't wash themselves, right? But notice in the story that Jesus tells Martha that what Mary chose was not, what Martha chose was not a bad thing. But what Mary chose was what? Better. Better. Martha wasn't choosing bad things. She just wasn't choosing best things. And there's a huge lesson in that for your life and my life. Learning to choose between better and best. Between good and better. So what does this have to do with us? Well, let me ask you. How often do you have good intentions about going to church or reading your Bible or spending time with God only to watch those good intentions kind of get lost in the busyness of everything you, what? Need to do. Need to do. Mm. See, there's the trick right there. That's the catch right there. And you want to know why we do that? It's because that we think that cheating our spiritual life doesn't have a cost. We think that cheating our spiritual life doesn't have a cost. See, because if I don't take out the trash, mama's going to kill me, right? There's a cost, big, scary cost, right? If I don't finish this homework, I'll fail class, and mama's going to kill me. There's a cost, right? If I miss a practice, the coach won't let me start, and dad's going to kill me. There's cost. There's a cost. But if I don't read my Bible, if I don't pray this morning, if I don't meditate this morning and get my heart right with God, well, he's got to forgive me, right, because he's God. And it's okay. It doesn't really cost me anything. In fact, if I skip church this week, I'll get even better grades. I'll do even better on that test because we think that there's no cost. But let me just assure you, There's a cost, and it's bigger than you think, and it's harder than you think. Here's a, I came up with a short list of what it costs to choose doing stuff over being with God. It costs, here's the price of distraction. Number one, it costs peace. It costs us peace. There is a deep knowing that you develop in your heart if you follow God for long enough. And it doesn't matter what kind of crap comes down in your life. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter how bad things get. There's a peace, the Bible calls it as a peace that passes understanding. It's a peace that's bigger than your junk, 
bigger than what's going on in your family, bigger than the fact that you can't get along with your mom. There's a peace that God is bigger. The second thing is assurance. And this is a, what I mean by assurance is there's a quiet, confident thing that goes on inside your heart. Uh, not that what you're doing is all that fabulous, but it's a confidence that God is who he is and will do what he says he's going to do. I don't think I'm okay, and I know it. It's, it's an assurance that everything's all right on some level or another. And then there's direction. Without growth or relationship with God, you will never discover, you will never discover who he is, who he built you to be, and because of that, you won't ever figure out what direction you're supposed to go in with your life. You're going to be confused. You're going to be like a lot of juniors and seniors get to their junior and senior year and suddenly realize, oh, crap, I'm about to be like an adult. Like, I got to make some choices here. Am I going to go to college? Am I going to, like, run off and live in a cave somewhere for two years? Or what am I going to do? Like, you have to make some decisions, and you have to actually grow up a little bit. And so if you don't have that built-up relationship over time, you're going to find yourself your junior or senior year going, what the junk am I supposed to do? I'm so, I have no idea. And so that's one of the things that it'll cost you. The next one is blessings. While God wants to give us good things, some, one of the things we talked about this last Sunday was that there is some connection, some kind of connection, between people who believed that God was going to do impossible things and him actually doing it. Nowhere in the Bible do you see Jesus just walk up to some random guy and do something amazing. It's always where somebody approaches him and says, yeah, I believe you are who you say you are. And then he blesses them in some way or he heals them in some way. So blessings. And then lastly, clarity. Because here's the deal, guys. What the right thing to do is becomes really fuzzy. Really fuzzy. Because you, you get to measure what, what's the right thing to do. Well, whose eye are you measuring that by? And if you don't know the God of right and wrong, then what is right and wrong gets really, really fuzzy and really confusing. So the cost of distraction is really high. The price of distraction is really high. Now, I want you to listen to this sentence. This is really important. I want to be sure I get it right. When we worship the God of achievement, getting things done and getting things done right becomes more important than the people around us or even the tasks themselves. When we worship the God of achievement, people drop down and lists go up. Because you'll step on whoever you need to step on in order to get things done. It's easy to get distracted, but the cost is really high. And the second thing we learned, and this is from Mary, is that Mary had chosen chosen. And I'm just going to bottom line this for us. I'm not going to dance around it very long. If you think about it for very long, you'll realize that most of the stuff in your life is kind of chosen for you. Like, think about it. How much of a choice do you have to be clothed today? I mean, you have a choice, but kind of not. How much of a choice do you have whether to eat today or not? You have a choice, but kind of not. And since we all need to eat, then eventually we all need to find a way to work, which means we need a job, which means we probably ought to go to school in order to get a job. And it all kind of connects, right? So a lot of the things that we do, we really don't have that much choice in. In fact, I would kind of argue that one of the only places that you have freedom is choosing God or not choosing God. True freedom is in choosing God or not choosing God. Because everybody worships something. And the question is, what do you worship? Who do you worship? Here's something I want you to hear is really important. Because, and here's the deal with distraction. Distraction chooses us. A life with God has to be chosen. You're not just going to fall into, you're not just going to accidentally become somebody who lives for God. You're going to have to choose it. Over and over and over again. That's why the Bible talks about dying to ourselves daily. See, don't miss this. The God of achievement is sneaky. Because here's the deal. When we set the God of achievement up there and we, we're like, okay, little God, I'm going to follow you. 
And so you're, you put him up there, right? What he does is he starts giving you things, right? You work hard. The God of achievement gives you things. People notice you. You get a promotion. Things start happening, and you're like, okay, okay. I'm digging this. This is nice, right? So you start working harder for the God of achievement. And before you know it, what happens is you become a slave to all that performance. Because guess what? It's never enough. Ever enough. And so you keep building and you keep building and you keep building and suddenly you are no longer free. Because you're so wrapped up in everything that this little God demands of you that pretty soon you become a slave to all the things that you have to get done just to maintain. You're out of control. Why? Because distraction chooses you, but a life with God is something you choose. So let me just give you a few things as we uh, bring this thing in for a landing uh, to help you along the way and to kind of figure this out. Now, um, and I hope that this will help you kind of put that little God back where he belongs. Um, so number one is this. Can you spot it? Can you spot it? Do you know if the God of achievement is a problem for you? And I just, uh, I wrote down some questions that I'm going to read to you. And I just want you to think through these questions. We've done this every week in this series. Um, so this is just an opportunity for you to think through these questions and go, okay, maybe I do have an issue with this. Or maybe I do have a problem with this. Um, number one, do you define yourself by what you've done or what you do? Number two. Do you measure others by their accomplishments and failures? Number three, are you frustrated by people who, in your opinion, just aren't getting it done? Number four, do you choose your tasks or do your tasks choose you? Number five, do you feel like time at church or with God is a waste? Number six, do your hopes and dreams rest with God or in your plans? Can you spot it? And if you answer some of those questions and you're like, yeah, you know what, if I'm perfectly honest, I think I might have a problem with this. Then uh, we're going to talk about have you got it. If you've figured out have, that you've got this thing, if you recognize that you have a tendency to be this way, I just want to say this to you. You are normal. Okay? You're okay. You're okay. Because everybody has a tendency for something, right? Everybody has a tendency to stray in this direction or in that direction. And if you're a person that kind of is a doer, thank God for you. This world would suck without you. Because doers make things happen. You get things done. The problem is you can't let it get out of control, right? You guys all know doers, right? So without doers, we don't have the light bulb. We don't have string cheese. Not okay, right? We don't have beard trimmers. Those are important for some of us. And we don't have indoor plumbing. Without doers, nothing ever happens. Everybody just sits around Jesus' feet going, what's up, y'all? And stuff accumulates you know toilets and things need to be clean so doers it's okay just realize if you've got it all right and then lastly how to beat it how to beat it how to put the little god back where he belongs here's how you do it number one do things uh, this is under the put the little god down section do things out of gratitude not attitude do things out of gratitude not attitude you don't have to do this you get to do this it's life church mantra uh, number, number two, the second one here, make your lists a guide instead of a Bible. Oh my goodness. You know who you are, right? Your, your list is your God. Your, your, these things have to be done or someone is going to burst into flames. It's, it's not true. Okay. Just make it a guide, not a Bible. Really important. Next, see yourself and others for who they are, not what they do. And last, let non-doers pull you toward being. Here's what I mean by that. We're all surrounded by people who are like Mary, and we're all surrounded by people who are like Martha, okay? And if you're a Martha, you need to let Mary's tell you to sit down every once in a while and just chill and be okay with that. And if you're a Mary, every once in a while, you need to let a Martha spur you to do something with your life, you loser. So that's the deal. So that's, there's that. Oh, and one more. Ask yourself, is this better or best? One of the best skills you can learn, one of the 
best skills you can learn in your life is to figure out how to prioritize your life. What's most important? What matters most? How do I organize things? How do I put things in, in order? And here's the, here's the reality. you got to cheat somewhere. You have to cheat somewhere. You just have to decide today where you're going to cheat. You have to cheat somewhere. You do. Because you're, there's just not enough hours in the day. There's just not enough hours to get everything done. And so you have to decide, okay, I'm going to cheat my family. Or I'm going to cheat on homework. Or I'm going to cheat on this. I'm going to cheat on that. There's no way for you to get it all done. You just have to figure out, okay, if there's not enough time in the day, what's going to get taken down? All right? And then lastly, raise God up. Raise the God up. So I made these little sheets for you. I don't know if they're on your table. Yeah, they should be. Uh, there's a heading at the top. Let me have that one, Alex. I didn't get one. Uh, <clears throat> So I made this for you. This is the, I don't normally send homework with you from 621, but I'm sending this homework with you, all right? So don't leave it on the table. Take it home with you. I'll give you this one, Alex. Uh, take it home with you. And here's what it says. At the top it says, God of Achievement Homework, Dan said I had to do or else. The or else involves something flammable. So, uh, so here's what you do. Here's what I want you to do. On the, in the left-hand column, and you don't have to fill them all in, weirdos, super achiever people. You don't have to fill them all in. You can have empty boxes. Just breathe. It'll be okay. All right. So you just write down stuff I do. I do band. I do homework. I do this. I clean my room. I whatever. <laughs> like that's going to be on there. All right. Uh, so you just write down stuff I do in the first column, right? Here's the stuff I do. You don't have to do it now. You can do it later. That's why I call it homework. And then number two, in the second column, you write down why I do it. Look, this is the big deal. If you can learn to be honest with yourself about why you do what you do, that's huge. That's huge. So just be really honest with yourself. Why do I feel the need to do this? Why do I do that? Some of the things are just things you have to do, right? And then in the third column, you're going to use numbers. So if you've got six things, you're going to number those, one through six, one being the most important thing and six being the least important thing, according to the world's priority, okay? So in other words, in the world's eyes, some things are really important. And then the next column, you're going to redo that a little bit and do it in the priority you think God would put it in. What's most important, what's least important. So just take that home, and hopefully that will help you work through it a little bit. We don't want to just tell you things here. We want to give you some tools um, to make a difference, okay? So as we close tonight, let me just say this really quickly. In the parade of little gods, okay, in the parade of little gods that are running around trying to attract your attention, okay, the God of achievement in the United States of America is toward the top. Nine, but here's the reality. 95% of the achievements that you chase after in your lifetime will die when you die. Most of the things that you chase after in your, time, in your lifetime will die when, you're dead, when you die. And same with me. Working hard and honoring God and being a person who tries to achieve things is not a bad thing. I hope you hear me say that. Not a bad thing. In fact, the Bible commands us to work as if we are working for God, not for paycheck and not for anything else. We are supposed to work hard. But what we, when we get into trouble is when we put that little God as part of our identity. Working hard and honoring God, not a bad thing, but finding our identity in what we do rather than who Christ is, that's something you will never, ever, 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 ever be comfortable with. You're just going to keep trying for that thing. You're going to keep trying to achieve, and you're never, ever going to get there. I promise. You're more than what you do, and you're definitely more than the part you play. I want to end tonight with a, a really great video. It's longer than most of the videos that I use, which is why I try to go short in the message. Um, but I, if you'll pay attention, this is one of those videos that you'll get out of what you put into. So focus and uh, let's try to watch this video.
you. Look at your eyes. Look at them. Speckled. Colorful. Each one unique. And I created every one of them. I created everything. The universe. And you. I gave you your personality. I made you pure. Complex. And every day, I give you life. I love you. But something happened. You cheated on me. You didn't trust me. You sinned. cut yourself off from me, and although you're still alive, you are slowly dying. So you looked for other things. To fill the void. But nothing works. It just kills you faster. Separates us more and more. What are you searching for? I don't want you to die. I created you, not to be destroyed, but to know me. So I became one of you, a fragile creation. I was tempted, but I never sinned. I came to save you. You have so many sins, and they have a cost. Someone has to die. You. Or me. So I took on your sin. And traded in my life for yours. And I died in your place. Because I love you. Then... Jesus, I'm not here to condemn you, I came to bring you back to life, rely on me, I will forgive you, and give you eternal life, I love you, and I did all of this to have a relationship with you. Will you follow me? Father, um, I want this so badly for every student in this room. God, I just pray that uh, for everyone here tonight, um, for those who have already decided to follow you and have already decided that they are all in, God, I just pray that we would you would give us the strength and the wisdom to know when we're getting things out of order. That you would convict us, um, not because you want to oppress us, but because you want us to be free. And God, for the students in this room um, tonight who have never chosen to follow you, have kind of been on the fence and haven't been able to figure out what they believe. Uh, I pray for them tonight, God. I pray specifically for them tonight, God, that they would learn to trust you, um, that they would follow you. 
And that from this day forward, God, everything would be different because they no longer have to perform. They no longer have to achieve. They no longer have to measure themselves by what they do or don't do. Today, all that can change. And God, if there's a student in this room tonight um, that wants that to happen, wants to um, cross the line and go from being a skeptic to being a follower, then I just pray that they would repeat this prayer after me. God, thanks for coming to get me. Thanks for becoming one of us. We followed so many different things instead of you. I've done so many things that I'm just not sure you're big enough to forgive me. But the Bible says that if I will believe in you, if I will believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that you're God, then I'll be saved. And that you will come into my heart and make things new. So God, come into my heart. Change me. Begin to fix me. And rescue my yesterdays, my todays, and my tomorrows. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with me for the very first time, and uh, the Bible says that there are angels that are partying like mad because it says that when one who is lost is found, uh, that the angels pitch a big fit. So uh, that's a really big deal. And uh, I want to help you in that. And we want to help you in that and how to grow beyond that and uh, learn what it is to be a follower of Christ. So if you prayed that prayer tonight, during the song, I'm going to be standing right down there just kind of off to the side. Uh, just sneak out from where you are, come over and talk to me, and uh, I'll help you along your way.